Welcome to Sundays at Coastal. This week, Pastor Andy Rock shares a sermon titled, Burning It All Down from James Chapter 3. In life, we make mistakes, but embracing humility allows us to learn and grow. Be tender, recognizing the need for mercy. Instead of striving for perfection, find courage and vulnerability. Let go of pride and excuses for hurtful actions, and open yourself to love and mercy from God and others. When we own up to our mistakes, we grow and we heal. Hi, friends. Good morning. Uh, we, we have, uh, is, is Rob here? Rob Coghill's here? Okay, what's outside? Do we have any of our elders here? Raise your hand if you're an elder. Nina's here. Jean's here. All those in, oh, Kurt's here. All those in favor of changing jobs, uh, Joe, uh, Joe's job title officially to the Minister of Chaos Management. Oh, yeah. Say aye. aye. Okay, great. Joe, you have a new job title. Uh, you are now officially the Minister of Chaos Management, which I think aptly fits your life. Uh, wanted to say real quick uh, to all of you both online and then here, uh, our Minister of Razzle Dazzle, Debbie Fries. Uh, it wants to say thank you for all of the cards and flowers and all of the well wishes she's been getting. She's doing better day by day. Um, so she's recovering. Uh, she's now, what, nine days out from gallbladder removal surgery. She's doing good. She's getting her strength back. She says she loves you. She wishes she was here this morning. And she says thank you, and she'll see you soon. Uh, so... Uh, Hey, if you are new or visiting with us this morning, it's always this fun. Like, like I'm not kidding. Legit, it is always this fun. Uh, but we believe in three things at this church. And this is uh, the heartbeat of our vision for our church is Isaiah 61. All of these things, uh, these truths, these three truths, they say are in Isaiah 61, but they're all over Scripture. It's the story of God's movement in us. The first is there's always hope beyond our brokenness. Always. There's never a moment when God says, oh, I'm done. There's never a moment when God throws up his hands and said, that's it, you're too far gone. You're, there's always hope beyond our brokenness. Second, we believe that we are called to trust in our risen Savior, to live, to speak, to act, to give out of faith in God who is alive. There are moments in our life when we wake up, when we realize, how did I ever believe that God wasn't big enough to handle this? And then a week later, you might think to yourself, oh, God can't take care of this. Hogwash. Faith, trust in Jesus is the best roller coaster ride you've ever been on. <laughs> it is scary. It is beautiful. It is thrilling. And it requires all of you. All of your strength, all of your mind, all of your heart, all of you. Third, we are called to bring restoration. So Tracy Bagnuda, I cannot wait for you to bring restoration into the life of the person that you're going to give change to a dollar this week. And we're going to do that with junior high kids and high school kids. We're going to do that with kids who need tutoring midweek. We're going to do that with your children and your grandchildren who are in our children's department. We're going to do that with your lives. We're going to pray that into you. We're going to bless you. We're going to provide furniture to people who are uh, without it. We are going to feed the hungry. We are going to help those in need. This is what we do as a church. We bring restoration. And you don't have to wait to get involved in that. You're invited right now. Yeah, you. I know. <laughs> you think, oh, I've sinned too much. Hogwash. You have it. You're invited right now to, to dip your toe into the water. It's not a, uh, you don't have to sign up for something for the next 65 years. You can, you can try out things in our church and say, where do I fit? Where do I belong? But the best part about coming on a Sunday is that you've seen God's restoration work all throughout the week, and then today's a celebration. It is the best. So each one of these truths, to trust Jesus to believe that there's hope beyond our brokenness, to bring restoration, has a choice attached with it. Excuse me. Can we proclaim together our choice to follow Jesus today? Yes. Let's declare this together. Today.
Amen? Amen. So, can I have permission to speak to your heart of hearts? Yes. Would that be okay? Yes. I want to give you a word of challenge today, because that's James chapter 3. That's where we are. And I also want to end the sermon with the word of profound hope. Can we do that? Okay. Where are we in the book of James? If you're new with us or if you just haven't happened to remember every single sermon I've ever preached. Um, today's James, James chapter 3, which is all about how the tongue is a fire which can burn everyone and every uh, thing around us down to the ground. Sweet. So, so far in the book of James, as you remember, James has given us two pieces of advice about speaking, about how we use our tongues. And remember, he's giving this advice not to just random people. He's given this advice to Christians which have been scattered across the Roman Empire because they've literally been persecuted. Their lives have been burned down to the ground. And James is going to speak this word to them. Does that make sense? James is talking to people who've been terribly wounded by other people. That's all of us. Nothing's changed. All of us have had parts of our lives singed and burned to the ground by other people. Say amen. 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 This word is to us. So, are you ready? These are the two passages that James have, has already talked about how we use our tongue or speak. And here we go. James chapter 1, verse 19. It goes like this. Read with me. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So, I know we already read this, but just hear it again. James is telling hurt people... Ready? Keep your heart tender enough to listen. You might think, I've been so wounded, I don't have to listen anymore. Keep your heart tender enough to listen to God and to other people. He's speaking to wounded people. He says, keep your heart forgiving enough so that you're slow to anger. I know it's tempting to think, I've been hurt so much, I have a right to be angry forever and burn it all down. No. Keep your heart tender enough to keep on forgiving so that you can be slow to anger. And keep your faith enough to ask Jesus for wisdom first and then to speak Second, so you're slow to speak. That's what James is saying, to really hurt people. James says in chapter 2, ready? Let's read together. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Aha, aha. Remember, this passage ends with this great line, mercy triumphs over judgment. That's the end of it. Ready? Okay. So you have two ways of going about life. I can either judge you and everyone else, including me, as being the judge of the universe. Aha. You're wrong. I'm right. Except at 3 a.m. when I say, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. So I can be judge or I can let Jesus be judge. And as he gives me mercy, I can give away mercy. Those are the only two options. There's no middle way. If you're judging and then a little bit of Jesus and judging and a little bit of mercy and judging and a little bit of mercy, you know what that's called? Judging. Right? Remember, when you mix the manure with the ice cream, sure changes that taste of the ice cream. <laughs> Copy? Doesn't do much to the manure. Speak and act. Speak and act as, though who are going to be as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because, 
Read this with me. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Do you want that for your life? Do you want to be judged by your own standards? Sure? Then stop it. <laughs> I'm preaching to my own heart. Yeah. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Speak mercy, not judgment. Speak mercy, not judgment. When you speak mercy, it doesn't mean you give up the truth. It doesn't mean that you just say, oh, whatever happens, this happens. It means that you're speaking mercy. I have been saved from the consequences eternally of my own horrible actions, and I've been given love and mercy I do not deserve, and I'm going to speak to you from that place. So that's where we've been so far in the book of James. This is why James then is going to spend 13 verses talking about really difficult things. He wants the background and understanding of, number one, be tender enough and forgiving enough and asking wisdom enough to say, God, I'm going to speak from that place. Speak from a place of mercy rather than judgment. But if you decide to not do that, here's what happens. Even if you're hurt, even if you've been betrayed, even if you've had your life wrecked and you think, you know what, I'm entitled to burn it all down, this is what will happen. Again, here's my words of warning coming from the book of James. I'm going to end with hope. So if you're being convicted right now, praise God. Because this is a moment where your life doesn't have to be on fire. If you're hoping that someone really next to you will listen to this, please understand that I'm not preaching to them. I'm preaching to you. So Jesus, help. Jesus, remove the resistance in our own hearts. Jesus, open our ears and our eyes. And we say to our own soul, awaken, O my soul. Amen? Okay. Are you ready? James chapter 3. Let's do this. Here we go. Woo! All right. Not many of you should become teachers. Crap. Why, my fellow believers? Read this to me. Back off. Mm. We all stumble in many ways. Yes. Uh, anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Anybody land in that category? No. Uh, we're all going to stumble and make mistakes. No one is perfect. Otherwise, every word out of your mouth would be beautiful. And since no one is perfect, teaching anybody, preaching to anybody comes with a heavy truth. Some of what I say and do, it's just going to be dead wrong. Now, I know times when I've mishandled God's word and got it exactly wrong. And I've paid for that. Because then I become an ineffective leader. Then I stop hearing God because I want it to be my way. And then things go really, really bad in my life. Now, I know as well that I'm blind to where I'm still getting it wrong. You know, there's, you know what you don't know, and then, then there's the category of I don't even know what I don't even know. You know what I'm saying? Right? So I know that I'm blind to things that I've got, I'm still getting wrong, but I don't even know that I'm getting them wrong. And if I pretend to be perfect and say, well, I'm God's gift to the church, and so look at me and how glorious I am, and everything that I'm saying must be right, I'm in trouble. 
Yes? I got I to gotta answer to Jesus for what I've poured into and preached into your own life. Right? You all, when you go to heaven, you're going to have amazing jobs. Do you know how many pastors are going to be in heaven? Like so many. There's that great joke of the lawyer and the pastor who show up to, you know, the pearly gates and, you know, the pastor is ushered into his humble little one-room apartment with a simple bed and a sink, you know, and a shared community toilet with all the other pastors in this apartment building. And then the lawyer is shown his majestic grand, you know, uh, mansion and the pastor goes, this, ga- this lawyer gets a mansion and I get an apartment? What, what gives, St. Peter? And Peter goes... Well, I mean, we got like a million pastors, but he's the first lawyer to ever, ever get in. So like, you know. (laughs) Look, if I'm getting it all wrong and leading you astray, Jesus himself said it would be better if a giant millstone was tied to my neck and I was thrown off the end of, of, of Pismo Beach Pier. Right? I, I'm held to account ability to what I'm saying to you. So what's the solution? What's the solution? It's not that no one should ever teach or no one should ever preach. Why? Because you teach and preach at your family all the time. You be yelling and screaming and exhorting, <laughs> demanding and urging, putting pepper on it, demanding to say Amen. Right? Amen? Amen? Yes. See? You do it to your kids. What's the solution? Here's the solution for everybody. Be humble enough to accept that sometimes you get it dead wrong. Remember, I'm not preaching to the person standing next to you. I got access to your text this week. Uh, Be tender enough to know you need mercy. And then finally, read this with me. Be courageous enough to have your reputation defined by your vulnerability rather than your perfection and your performance. That's not easy. Like, it takes courage to listen to another person when they tell you you're wrong. James says it. We all make mistakes. And we're like, oh, yeah, James, that's fine. But that doesn't mean that when someone comes to you and says, hey, you're making a mistake, that we go, oh, that's so nice. Thanks for telling me. Right? What we tend to do is be defensive and prideful and push back and say, oh, yeah, well, look at all the wrong you've done. Look at all the right I've done. How come I've done all this right and just a little bit of wrong, and then you're like, you're getting mad at me? Like, let's look at the scales here. That's just defensiveness and pride. It's not helpful. It's ugly. Why? Why? Because I'm minimizing my mistakes and also your hurt when I start comparing them to all the right I've done versus the little wrong. I'm saying, you know what? What you've done, what I've done to you is not that big a deal. And and it's not love, and it actually prevents mercy. How? You can't give me mercy if I'm telling you that I don't need mercy because what I did isn't that big of a deal. But let's be honest. I don't want a world in which I need mercy. I mean, I want a world where you need mercy. And I'll be magnanimous to give it to you (laughs) for a price. So it's not mercy. But I don't want to ever need it. When someone has the courage to confront you, accept responsibility fully without defending, without performing, so that they can give you mercy. And in that moment, it's not easy to push away the voice voice of martyrdom and failure. By the way, every passage I preach, I have to go through. So this was my week. 
Um, it's not easy to push away the voice of martyrdom and failure that says, oh, woe is me. I'm such a failure. I'm such an awful person. Have pity on me. So that's what we can do when we accept responsibility. We can go, you're right. I'm terrible. I'm so terrible. I'm so awful. Oh, God. Oh, I'm so awful. Oh, you're right. Why is that all ugly to do? Because now I'm making it all about me. They say, you're hurting me. And I say, I know I'm so terrible. Pay attention to me and rescue me. I'm demanding that the person I've hurt should rescue me. And that's not love. That's just narcissism. James say we stumble in many ways. We sure do. But to claim you don't stumble or to minimize it or to wallow in it and make it all about you, ooh, that causes damage. How? James explains. Are you ready? Verse 3. Here we go. So exciting. <laughs> when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Yeah? Yeah? Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by an itty-bitty rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Read this verse 5 with me. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body. Oh, your tongue is small, but what? Yeah, it's going to determine the course and direction of your entire life. What you say matters. Just like Zed was saying when he was leading worship, what you pray matters, what you say matters. Let's not be in the game, right, which is so popular in our culture these days, to think, you know what, it doesn't really matter what I do. I can't make that much of a difference. Hogwash. On the order of creation, you're higher than angels. And your words have an impact. Your words literally, physically, in the very nature of being, that fancy word called ontology, they make a difference. Dr. Masuro Emoto, a scientist, spoke specific words over ice crystals as they were free freezing. Here's what they look like. Are you ready? One on the left is love. In the middle is thank you. This is what an ice crystal looks like when you speak I hate you over it. Can you see the difference in the beauty of I love you or thank you or I hate you? Your words literally create sonic resonances that shape fabric of reality. They have spiritual and physical consequences. How about this one? Next slide. Here's you fool on the left. Here's thank you on the right. That's what happens. Dr. Emoto then did the exact same experiment with rice over the course of 30 days. He put three bottles of rice together. This is white rice, sealed the tops. He spoke, I love you, to one bottle. He ignored the middle bottle, and then he spoke hate over the third bottle. This is what they look like over 30 days. You can do this at home. There's dozens of pictures over the internet of people doing the exact same thing at home. It's amazing. I think there's one more slide, too. Here's love and hate. That's the difference. What rice looks like 30 days in a jar when you just speak words to it. What you say shapes the direction and course of your life. Aren't you convinced by rice <laughs> now of that truth? Verse 5, James says this, Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also fire. It's not a spark. What is the tongue? And fuego! <laughs> a world of evil among the parts of body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire. <laughs> Read this with me. I love this last line. And is itself set on fire. What? 
James is writing to Christians. He's like, uh, hey, guys, uh, you're burning it all down with your tongues. What in the world? Our tongue literally is burning ourselves and everyone else to the ground? Really? Well, yeah, think about it for a second. Take the first phrase. The tongue is a fire and a world of evil. When you light something on fire, what happens? The damage is done. Can, can you wipe it off? Can you clean it off? Can you throw it in the laundry and fix it? The damage is forever done when you light something on fire. When you speak a word of guilt, shame, anger, evil towards another person, they are burned by that word. It stays with them. You know the whole sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? Nope. Anybody still suffering from the skin knee you got when you were seven? No, your body's healed. But the words spoken to over you when you were a kid, you still carry with you to this day. All you can do when you burn someone with your words is that you can say, I'm sorry, but they're still burnt. The consequences for what you say, and when you light someone's life on fire with your words, it hurts, and they stay hurt until God rebuilds them. Now, I know there are moments when you want to burn the whole world down with your words. You want to burn that person online with your perfectly timed, perfectly worded attack. You want to singe your spouse or your child for how they cost you, and this passage certainly applies. But James is talking more than just you being angry and wanting to light the world on fire with your words. The tongue can set your whole life on fire. How? When you perform and regularly lie. I'm really good at this. I'm really good at performing, which is a lie. It's acting like I'm okay, but I'm not. It's a form of lying. Why does that burn your life? Why? Because you literally become two different people when you perform. There's regular Andy, and then there's performance Andy. Hey, how you doing? I'm so great. And here's what lights your world on fire. Are you ready? After a while, if I keep on performing, the real me will think I am the performance. Until I promise something to someone and you can't perform a promise. It has to come from the depths of your heart. So this week, this week, I discovered that I totally lied to my friend. I promised them something. I promised to be there for them. And then I fell asleep, and I wasn't. And here's what happened. I got a text at 1.30 a.m. in the morning from another friend of mine who said, I have family who's in trouble. They're 800 miles away. Do I go right now and help my family? And I said, yes, absolutely. And then I realized that as that friend left for a 1,600 round trip mile excursion to go care for their family, that they were loving their family and keeping good on their promise while I had fallen asleep on mine. That's called a two by four from God, pa pow, to wake me up. To wake me up to realize, oh, oh, I'm not who I think I am. And when I, when I understand that I am not who I think I am, that there's a performance me and a regular me, now it helps me to see that the performance of me is lighting my life on fire because I can't come through with my promises. Does that make sense? Here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. It's lighting your world on fire isn't just because you say something bad. You can also say something good to the people around you like your kids over and over and over again. Oh, you're fantastic, you're wonderful, you're amazing, you're beautiful. They misbehave, it's okay, it's not a big deal. 
We can literally turn them into entitled sociopaths <laughs> by never confronting them and only telling them good and wonderful things. And then when they display behaviors in their life which are like their world's on fire, we think, oh, that's fine, that's normal, that's cute, oh, I like that. Oh, you're with your other fire where life's on fire, friends? Fantastic. And we think that we're actually doing something good, and we're not. We're just watching our children burn because we don't want to have to say, your life's on fire. So how do I say this clearly? Your words matter. Did I do it? Okay, great. Uh, uh, your words make an impact. You can either speak words of love and mercy and build someone up, or you can burn them down. Your choice. Your choice. James continues, so we get the point. Verse three, uh, 7, are you ready? This is great analogies. You're going to love it. Here we go. Read with me. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Man, we can teach dogs, cats, orangutans, orcas, train fleas. We got it all, man, but we can't tame their, our tongue. Why? Because it's a restlessness that comes out of our own heart. From the fullness of your heart, your mouth speaks. That's Proverbs. And the deadly, deadly poison in our own hearts, it comes through our tongue. Why does James keep on making the same point four different ways? We got it, didn't we? Here it is. I think this is what's happening. James is making an even deeper point about our human nature. Whatever is in your heart will always come out. You can't hide what's in you. Like your performance won't hide what's in you. You understand? You can tell the difference between real Andy and performance Andy. Yes? You can see it in other people in your life. Oh, they're just acting right now. They can see it when you do it, too. <laughs> Whatever is in your heart will come out. He then gives this awful illustration. Verse 9. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in the likeness of God. Out of the same mark, mouth comes praise and manure. <sighs> This should not be. This should not be. Verse 11. Look, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? No. My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives? No. Can a grapevine bear figs? No. Can Seattle produce a winning baseball team? <laughs> Right? No, no, it's only salt water up there. Right? <laughs> Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. In other words, they don't mix. So what do we do? How, do, how can we not light others on fire? How do we build rather than burn it all down? How do we do that? And how do we understand all of this knowing that we all make mistakes? Right? Well, first, you got to be honest with yourself. I ha that's my responsibility. That's your responsibility. We have to be honest with ourselves and don't pretend that we're perfect. Would you like to do that today? Yes. Would you pray with me? Yes. I'm going to preach for two more minutes afterwards, but this is a moment of prayer. Pray with me. Jesus, please show me the parts of my heart that are still hurting, where I'm still angry, where my heart needs healing. It's up on the screen in case you didn't get it. Pray that prayer. That's you being honest with yourself. That's you saying, the things where I light other people on fire comes from a place of hurt. Yes. Secondly, 
look, then this is going to take even more courage. You got to be honest with other people about what's going on in your heart. This is why we do table talk. This is why we do these prayer times. This is why I'm vulnerable with you on a Sunday morning. Because if I'm not honest with you, if you're not honest with each other, there ain't no place to go. Either I perform or I'm honest. That's it. Those are the options. Be honest with another person because then that part of you can get healed. And no one's tamed our, your tongue completely. I haven't. Why? Because there's still parts of me that are being healed. And here's the hope of the gospel, friends. That as you share with another person what's going on in your life, and maybe you're the one listening, here's what's amazing. You get to do the thing that Jesus has done for you, that we just did during worship. You get to speak salvation and mercy and hope and love into their life. You get to be the one that takes all of the burnt and just ashes of their life, and God gets to use you to speak something new into them. Listen, there's parts of my life that have just been burned to the ground, and God is building something different and new. It's beautiful. And I'm having people speak the, that hope into my life. You're that person for someone. You're that person for someone. Speak love into their life, mercy into their life, hope into their life. Because that's what God does to you when you're just a pile of ashes. Because he loves you. Amen? Amen. Jesus, bless and seal this good news in our hearts. This word of hope out of the ashes, out of the embers. God, you are creating something new and beautiful in us because you speak that into our lives. It's the deep truth that you are never apart from us. You're always with us. You're always creating something beautiful out of nothing. And I just pray blessing upon my friends. Bless and seal the good, woo, good news in their hearts. And I pray, God, for all, all of us who've walked away knowing, oh my gosh, I've lit another person on fire. I need to say I'm sorry. I pray this week would be a week of reconciliation, a week, uh, a week of apologies, a week of hope, uh, a week where we could take ownership over what we've done. And Jesus, I ask that you bless and seal every good word that has been spoken to build up my friends. In Jesus' name I pray. Would you stand? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. we have amazing food for you. If you want prayer, come forward. We'll pray for you. Pastor Andy Rock is the senior pastor of Coastal Community Church. It's located in Grover Beach, California, and serves communities across the Central Coast. Join us online each week on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our weekly live stream. We also have two in-person services at 9 a.m. and 1040 a.m. in our sanctuary. Coastal Community Church is located at 1830 Farrell Road, Grover Beach, California. For more information, visit our website, www.mycoastal.org. Thanks for joining us, and I hope you have a great week.